This week, I've been reminded of the importance of focusing first on right questions rather than right answers. So often, we start with the wrong questions, and thus, in answering, we end up in a place that is somewhere on the spectrum of merely not useful to flat out wrong. Instead, we should focus on discerning what is the best question in this particular situation. I find this to be particularly true with theological issues. Two of the most common theological questions people ask me are this. One, how can God be all-powerful and merciful and yet allow suffering? And two, did I really believe in the virgin birth? Now, that first question is a doozy. It is a great question. I hate to disappoint you this morning, but that is a conversation for a later time. <laughs> the second question, however, provides a more relevant example to the situation we find ourselves in with our gospel lesson today. The theological proposition of Mary's virgin birth of Jesus challenges everything we know about how things work. Indeed, science has discovered that some creatures can reproduce asexually, but humans are not one of them. Yet, the answer to this question is actually quite easy. Sure, if one believes that God is indeed powerful enough to have created all that is seen and unseen, then it follows that, of course, God could have done this. Now, while that may be the easy answer, I argue that the question itself misses the point. The more interesting questions might be this, what truth is revealed by this story of divine conception within humanity? Looking at the world about us through the lens of this story, what do we see now? The very best answer I have ever heard to these questions of the virgin birth was this. It is so beautiful, it has to be true. It is so beautiful, it has to be true. This answer proposes we view the question theologically instead of historically or scientifically rather than argue whether or not such an action is even possible, which of course assumes that we really understand creation, this response proposes we view the question from a different angle through the theological lens of beauty. In this case, beauty within creation is a signpost pointing beyond itself to the source of all beauty that is God. Now, making this shift requires that we shift our perspective, right? That we take a different grounding for our argument. And I think that this is something like what's going on in our gospel lesson today. Our lesson from Mark is a composition of two healing stories that don't seem to have much to do with each other. While both of them are interesting, I'd like to focus this morning on the first one the story of the Syrophoenician woman and the healing of her daughter. Read by itself, this story is jarring, stunning, really. Jesus' rebuke and rejection of this Gentile woman is shocking. It's hard not to recognize the language he uses as anything but outright insulting. And yet, after the woman gives a clever and perhaps defiant retort, Jesus suddenly reverses course and affects the healing anyway. What is going on here? One way to understand this story is to read it as a companion to last week's gospel lesson. Last Sunday, if you recall, Jesus schooled the Pharisees, upending their sanctimonious piety, purity rules and self-righteous notions of outward signs of piety that ignore the corruption within. Jesus seemed to turn on its head the old notions of who was in and who was out, what was pure and what was defiled. 
In the end, Jesus called those Pharisees hypocrites, all of us who polish the outsides of our cups but do not clean the inside. A radical new orientation to love and relationship is defined, for Jesus says, it is not what goes into our bodies that corrupts, it is what comes out. So, right, we have this story and like, boom, mic drop. Jesus moves on directly to the story we heard this morning. Now, Jesus is really tired, right? And he wants to be left alone. And yet again, the needy, the sick, and the desperate continue to hound him for help and salvation. In this case, it is a Gentile woman, a Syrophoenician, whose daughter is possessed by an unclean spirit. While Jesus tries to hide away and rest, this woman approaches him and begs him to help her daughter. Here, we expect Jesus to reach across the religious and ethnic boundaries, behold this non-Jewish woman with compassion, and say to her, have no fear, your faith has made your daughter well. But instead of this anticipated merciful response, Jesus just brusquely dismisses her, saying, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Now, the children in this statement do not include her Gentile daughter, but rather the children of Israel. Even more than simple rudeness, his words reinforce ethnic boundaries and degrade this, this vulnerable woman. But rather than being cowed by Jesus' dismissal, this woman has the audacity, or perhaps merely is desperate enough to talk back. She argues with Jesus. With remarkable verbal deafness, she turns his words around on him, saying, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And to our surprise, he pauses to consider her argument and her persistence, and he relents. He changes his mind and replies, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. Now, over the millennia, this story has made many a believer and theologian very uncomfortable. How could Jesus, the one who is God in man, the one without sin, change his mind? Is that even possible? Can Jesus lose an argument? How are we to reconcile this rude man with the Christ of compassion and mercy? Jesus just seems so ordinary in this story, so much like one of us. Because we prefer an always perfect God-man, we are surprised by his humanity. We expect immutable divinity. Instead, we are smacked in the face with what feels like and seems like fallible humanity. Right after Jesus accuses the Pharisees of hypocrisy, he is called out by this Gentile woman for his very own. But the best question here is not, could Jesus change his mind? Because it, again, it's like, sure, right? But the question here should be, what truth does this story reveal? Many scholars and theologians have labored to argue that Jesus didn't really change his mind and why this story does not conflict with our theological understanding of Jesus' divinity. Yes, yes, yes. I understand, and I agree, and I do not wish to preach heresy, but I find this question less interesting. In this story... I imagine Jesus not as some entitled king regally dismissing this Gentile woman because she is not an Israelite, but rather I, un this, I understand this story as God in man, Jesus, who is really, really tired <laughs> and just needs a night off. It's been a long and busy couple of weeks, and he's exhausted. Then comes this stranger woman, a Gentile, in fact. In his exhaustion, he doesn't really see her, but 
reacts without thinking, right? Brushing her off rudely. And who among us has not been rude and dismissive when tired? That this woman talks back to Jesus itself is shocking. And that, coupled with the cleverness of her argument, seems to wake him up and reveal that he was perhaps engaging in exactly the same hypocrisy as the Pharisees. Some of my favorite gospel stories are the ones that reveal Jesus' humanity. These are the stories in which he gets tired, he sleeps, he needs a break to pray and to refresh, the stories in which he loves and rejoices in the people around him. The stories in which he takes the time to cry and mourn before he raises from the dead. The stories in which he calls out to God in fear and anguish to remove this cup from him before accepting and submitting to God's will. For me, the power and the blessing of the incarnation of Emmanuel, God with us, is that God is indeed with us. With us in our suffering, with us in our physicality, with us in our joy, and with us in our confusion. We may fear and worship a God who is wholly other than us. But we will love a God who understands our humanity and our complicated mix of contradictions, conflicting emotions, and blurred ethics and motivations. To understand the Christian doctrine of the Trinity and the dual nature of Jesus is to understand God not only as a creator who desires our fidelity and worship, but also that for love deigns to enter the human stage and show us how to be fully human. Our God not only was willing to assume the constraints of mortal human life, but also the contradictions and perhaps the hypocrisy inherent to it. Simply put, we are continually surprised by the humanity of Jesus. But it is in this revelation of humanity within divinity that makes this story so delightful and filled with unexpected hope and promise. Amen. <laughs>